The gospel reading this morning from the New Testament is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10. It's found on page 47 of the New Testament in your pew Bible. Mark chapter 10, beginning with verse 35. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus replied, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant for it is for those to whom it has been prepared. When the other 10 disciples heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them all together and said to them, you know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them and their great ones are tyrants over them but it is not so among you. For whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to to minister, for the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom to many. Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. As we begin to explore God's word this morning, I would ask you to please pick up your copy of today's bulletin. Look at the cover page. And on the right side of the cover page, you will see that all members of the church family are listed as ministers of Northside Presbyterian Church. It may be that you have noticed this designation before, or it may be that you are seeing it for the first time. How does it make you feel? I'm a bit apprehensive about being in this pulpit this morning, but do each of you actually consider yourselves to be ministers of God's church here at Northside? As we continue in our journey through the Gospel of Mark, we can see that there was indeed much apprehension also among Jesus' disciples concerning their perceived roles in his coming kingdom. In chapter 9, we found the disciples debating the issue of whom amongst them should be considered the greatest. Showing much restraint and patience, Jesus explains to them that one must be willing to go to the end of the line to become greatest in the kingdom of God. That those considered to be first in the pecking order must humble themselves and instead become last. Have you ever wondered why we serve the sacrament of Holy Communion in the manner that we do here at Northside? Why do the ushers release those sitting in the back of the sanctuary first when coming forward to receive the communion elements? The principle of the last becoming first and the first becoming last contains the answer. It's all a part of becoming a minister in God's church. In today's reading from Mark, the disciples are once again considering 
their rightful place in the kingdom of heaven. Two disciples actually put in their request to sit on either side of Jesus in his kingdom. And once again, Jesus is forced to explain to them that the greatest in God's kingdom are those that are willing to humble themselves and minister unto others instead of always expecting to be ministered unto. In mulling over recent events in my mind, I have sought to discover examples of those that would best exemplify the true spirit of ministering unto others. I've chosen two men, one that none of you know, and one that I would guess that a great majority of you will at least recognize. If you'll bear with me a minute, we'll explore what can be learned from the lives of these two men and how we can apply those lessons to our own ministry here on earth. The first gentleman was born in northern Illinois in 1925 and passed away in September of this year at the age of 90. Russell Marsh was born into a Midwestern family that included two older brothers and one sister. His sister was Beverly Marsh, who in 1948 became Beverly Harvey, and in 1955 became my mom. Russell Marsh was my Uncle Russ. Uncle Russ grew up in uh, Trinity Lutheran Church in Rockford, Illinois, and every Sunday morning the first hymn they sang was, Holy, Holy, Holy. So thank you, Susan, and thank you, choir, for including that today. Uncle Russ grew up in the Great Depression years of the 1930s, and uh, as part of what Tom Brokaw of NBC News has designated as the greatest generation. He was drafted into military service after the outbreak of World War II, and he became a member of the U.S. Army Air Forces. In 1944, at the ripe old age of 19, Uncle Russ took part in over 30 bombing missions as a gunner on U.S. warplanes that took off at night in England, flew over the English Channel, dropped their bombs on industrialized areas deep in German territory, and then returned. On his last visit to Chattanooga not too many years ago, he sat down with me and in an intense one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation spoke of the details of his service in World War II to me for the very first time. Like many of his fellow comrades, this was not something that was pleasant to discuss for him and was done in anything but a boastful manner. Upon the conclusion of the war in 1945, Uncle Russ returned home to Illinois and wanted nothing more than to be able to peacefully continue making his contribution to society. He married my Aunt Lorraine uh, shortly after his return and produced, and they produced a family of six very wonderful children. Uncle Russ spent his professional career working for the B.F. Goodrich Tire Company, first in individual tire stores throughout northern Illinois, and then finally as a customer service executive in the company's office in the western Chicago suburbs. Uncle Russ lived a quiet, responsible, and respectful life, but late in his professional career, much was suddenly asked of him. You see, his employer decided that he could suddenly do the company a much greater service by being transferred from the Chicago office to Kansas City at a time when Uncle Russ only had four or five years left before retirement. At that stage in his life, the last thing he wanted to do was to sell his house and move away from his family. I gained a lot of respect for him as I watch from a distance, as he once again took the attitude of the greatest generation and humbly did what had to be done. Uncle Russ successfully completed his professional career in Kansas City 
and was able to return to Northern Illinois with full retirement benefits. He was certainly a loving husband, a loving father, a loving grandfather and great-grandfather, and truly a great uncle. A true minister to his family, to his country, and to his employer. The second gentleman I bring before you this morning, you might recognize. Like Uncle Russ, he was born in the Midwest in 1925 and passed away uh, this past September at the age of 90. Lawrence Peter Barra was born of Italian immigrant parents and grew up in the Italian neighborhood of Southwest St. Louis that was known simply as The Hill. During his teenage years, young Larry Barra and his buddies went to the neighborhood movie theater one Saturday afternoon. And one of the movies they saw that day was a travelogue of the country of India. The movie contained a piece about a Hindu holy man known as a yogi who sat flat on the floor in meditation with his feet folded under him and his arms folded across his chest. After the movie, young Larry Barra's friends mentioned that the Indian holy man reminded them of Larry in both demeanor and mannerisms. They hung the name Yogi on their friend, and the legend of Yogi Barra was born. Like Uncle Russ, Yogi grew up in the Great Depression years and was drafted into military service at the outbreak of World War II. Yogi was a member of the United States Navy and at the age of 19, floated for over six hours in a small gunboat just off the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, June 6, 1944. Yogi was wounded that day and later received the Purple Heart and two Navy battle stars. But his goal was always to return home to the USA and begin his pursuit of the American dream. Yogi's version of the American dream began with his marriage to his St. Louis sweetheart and then with his pursuit of a career in professional baseball. Yogi signed a contract with the New York Yankees shortly after his return home, which included a signing bonus of the whopping sum of $500. I'm pretty sure that today's Yankees receive that much in meal money alone for a three-day road trip. After a short period in the minor leagues, Yogi joined the Yankees for good in 1947. During his career with the Yankees, Yogi was a member of teams that won an incredible 13 American League championships and 10 world championships. No player has ever played on more championship teams in Major League Baseball than Yogi. He was named most valuable player of the American League on three separate occasions and even managed two different teams to championships in their respective leagues. In 1972, Yogi was elected to the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Yogi was beloved by his Yankee teammates as the ultimate team player, but his self-professed crowning moment came long after his retirement from baseball. In 1999, the Yogi Berra Museum and Learning Center opened on the campus of Montclair State University in Montclair, New Jersey. Instead of just being a place for memorabilia, the facility features hands-on exhibits where school groups can learn about history, math, physics, and other subjects with all with a common thread back to the game of baseball. Upon Yogi's death, President Obama referred to him as a true national treasure. He was indeed a loving husband, a loving father, a loving grandfather, a faithful employee, and truly a great teammate, a true minister to his family, his country, and to the game he loved. 
Now, all of these ramblings bring me to the focal point of today's gospel message. The message we are to receive today from the greatest minister of all. When you walk into this sanctuary, what is your focal point? What do you notice first? What demands your attention? I hope your answer would be the beautiful cross that adorns the front wall. On Sunday mornings when the weather is good, it's a little chilly to do this this morning, but when the weather's good, I love to open the middle doors of the sanctuary early in the morning and then open the front doors of the church and walk out to the sidewalk in front of the building. As Susan begins to practice the musical pieces for the day's service, I hope each time that someone on the sidewalk will stop, hear the music, and see the cross through the open front doors. A big part of Northside's ministry to this neighborhood is making the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ available to all. You've heard the following words spoken many times from this pulpit, but they definitely bear repeating. You heard John 3, 17 in today's assurance of pardon. For God the Father sent not his only Son into the world to condemn the world, but instead so that the world might be saved through him. And when God the Father sent his only Son into the world, Jesus Christ died for us on this cross. Even more important than that, on the very first Easter Sunday, Jesus Christ rose for us, defeating sin and death. Today, Jesus Christ reigns in power for us at the right hand of God in heaven. And never forget that every minute of every day, Jesus Christ prays for each one of us and for the salvation of our souls. The Apostle Paul tells us that in Jesus Christ, we are all new creations, dead to sin and alive to all that is good. Scripture passage from Isaiah that Leslie read earlier in the service describes the perfect minister for God's church. One that is humble, one that is respectful, one that does his duty when God calls, no matter how difficult that might be. In this season of stewardship on the church calendar, don't we owe the one that sacrificed everything for us portion of our time, talents, and yes, even our money. After all, everything that we have is a gift from God, loaned to us to use for the furtherance of his kingdom here on earth. You know, Yogi Berra was well, well known for his homey, quirky sayings that often left people scratching their heads. Two of the most repeated of these sayings were, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Or, it ain't over till it's over. At Yogi's funeral, the Catholic Cardinal in charge of the Archdiocese of New York put it this way, there is no fork in the road to eternal life because that road run straight through this cross. And in that respect, it ain't ever over. May the lessons we've learned here today from the lives of Uncle Russ and Yogi Berra, and especially those lessons we've learned from the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through the study of God's holy word be applied to our own individual lives as we all strive to become more effective ministers each day in this, the Church of Jesus Christ. Amen.